Welcome to People in Power. I'm Juliana Rufus. On today's programme, Dirty Money. It takes two to tango. This is a real sort of complicity in the perpetuation of corruption and dictatorship. And it's time that the financial sector took responsibility for its role in this. The recent uprisings across the Middle East and North Africa have revolved around one common theme, a popular desire for freedom from repression. But there's often been an economic undercurrent too. The lavish lifestyles enjoyed by dictators have fueled widespread anger at the way national assets have been looted for the benefit of the few. So what happens to all this wealth once it's spirited out of the country? Can it ever be recovered? And why does the international banking system make it so easy for corruption to flourish? We asked veteran financial journalist Steve Levinson to look for answers. Colonel Gaddafi's Libya is in revolt. Egypt's Hosni Mubarak has been pushed from power. Tunisia's Ben Ali was the first to go. As well as having power, they were all very rich. Now, Western governments are scrambling to find their wealth and freeze it. But how, as if by magic, did their assets get through in the first place? The answer involves hidden accounts, tax havens, and shell companies, and a banking and regulatory system unable to see through the corruption and halt the flow of dirty money. In leafy North London, this is the Bishop's Avenue, but it's better known as Billionaire's Row, where only the super rich can afford to live. In this street, just a stone's throw away, where houses go for about 10 million pounds each, Residents recently discovered they had a famous new neighbour, Colonel Gaddafi's son, Saif. But Saif is no longer to be found on the premises. Instead, it's occupied by squatters, flying the flag for a liberated Libya. Inside, the new occupiers are clear about their motives. We're all Libyans that just love our country, and we're just coming here to help support our cause. Every Libyan in his own or her way are trying to support the cause for Libya. The deeds of ownership don't actually have a Gaddafi name on them. Instead, they show a shell company, Capitana Seas, based in the British Virgin Islands. Someone obviously didn't want the real ownership to be easy to work out. The house is currently one of the assets frozen by order of the British Treasury. At the last count, 12 billion pounds has been frozen by the banks in the UK. In the US, the figure has reached 34 billion dollars. Five billion has been identified in one unnamed bank. Obviously, a huge amount of Gaddafi's money has washed through the banks. There's no reason that Mr. Gaddafi and his family could have had that money legitimately. So it has to be illegal. Um, then the question, of course, is why would they take it? The real failure is on the part of governments and regulators to get banks to do the due diligence they're supposed to do. The fact that billions of dollars of potentially corrupt funds have been frozen is a huge indication that perhaps they shouldn't have been there in the first place. Colonel Gaddafi and others associated with so-called dirty money, like Mubarak, have been nicknamed kleptocrats, from the ancient Greek word for thief. In fact, in the financial world, all political leaders, no matter how honest, and their families are designated politically exposed persons, or PEPs. Banks are supposed to pay special attention if one of them, or anyone connected to them, seeks to open a bank account. The onus is very clearly on the banks to find out who their customers are and where the money is coming from. But the Gaddafi case, and that of others before it, raises the question of whether the banks in Britain and other Western financial centres actually abide by the rules or even care. They're supposed to operate a system of due diligence, but according to their critics, they are complicit in the corruption. Neither corruption nor dictatorship can take place without the role of a bank. It takes two to tango. This is a real sort of complicity in the perpetuation of corruption and dictatorship. 
and it's time that the financial sector took responsibility for its role in this. We asked numerous banks here in London for interviews but none of them would agree to take part. But off the record they complain that the definition of a PEP, a politically exposed person, is too vague and there's no official government list of PEPs. They also argue that there's a limit to how deep they can reasonably be expected to dig if somebody is trying to hide their identity behind layers and layers of secrecy. But that's an attitude that can leave the banks badly exposed, as some of them have found to their cost. RBS was in trouble in 2010, when it was fined £5.6 million by the UK regulator, the Financial Services Authority, for failing to have adequate systems and controls in place to prevent money laundering. In the United States, another well-known British bank, Lloyd's TSB, acknowledged criminal conduct and paid a $350 million penalty in January 2009 for breaching US financial sanctions. The bank had been systematically stripping out customer information about wire transfers from banks in Libya, Sudan and Iran. After high-profile cases in the 1990s, like the closure of BCCI and the corrupt funds of former Nigerian dictator Sani Abacha, banks are supposed to have tightened up their procedures. But as the case of Gaddafi has shown, billions of pounds still finds its way into the financial system. At the heart of their control systems, banks employ compliance officers, like former National Crime Squad detective Martin Woods. Martin worked as a senior anti-money laundering officer for a US bank in London called Wachovia. I was a police officer for 18 years and I entered the world of banking, the city of London if you will. And so I brought with me a very different attitude, not necessarily a unique attitude because there are many other former police officers who work in banking. Not to say I was cynical but I would apply my prior expertise and experience. When he discovered thousands of travellers' cheques with dubious signatures were being encashed in Mexico, he raised the alarm in London and the US. He fired off dozens of SARs, suspicious activity reports, but the reaction from his superiors at the bank wasn't what he expected. It was resentment because, um, on the one hand, I'm identifying issues that perhaps they should have identified, they've chosen to ignore, and in, in some ways I've shattered the, I've broken the bubble, I've shattered the, the crystal ball, because the money-making venture that they're all engaged in has now been shown up for be, to be what it was, which is a pretty dangerous, if not a criminal, enterprise. It turned out that Martin had discovered the tip of a huge iceberg of Mexican drugs money laundering that ran into billions of dollars. Wachovia, since taken over by Wells Fargo, agreed to pay the US authorities $160 million in penalties. Martin never worked for his bank again and has since become a consultant, advising institutions on compliance and how to protect themselves against suspect money. But he says the culture in banking has not changed and the bonus system is at the heart of its compliance problems. The whole cycle is run on a 12-month bonus culture and the bonus can, can both incentivise and compromise <clears throat> and there's no way that a bonus, finance indeed, should be used to compromise the integrity and conduct of risk officers, compliance officers, legal advisers. There are certain areas which include in particular compliance that should not be part of a bank's helicopter culture. One man who's been investigating banks on behalf of the US authorities for 30 years is Jack Bloom. After the BCCI and Abacha scandals, he thinks many banks have improved their compliance systems. But others have not, and for these the regulators need to get much tougher. There are always going to be a certain number of institutions, some of them quite large, that simply don't play by the rules and they have to be cracked down on. I think the critical thing is that when we catch somebody in the act the next time around, the punishment really should fit the crime and perhaps they wind up losing a banking license or are very se severely sanctioned. And that'll send the clear message, this behavior is no longer acceptable.
national governments lay down the rules for tackling money laundering and corruption in each country. But the global standards are set by a little-known international organisation called the Financial Action Task Force. From its headquarters within the OECD in Paris, it has laid down dozens of recommendations for its mainly rich member nations. The problem is that when it comes to enforcing the rules on PEPs, no one pays much attention. The Financial Action Task Force, with its headquarters here, recently conducted a survey into how many countries had adopted its recommendation for tighter control of PEPs. Of the 24 countries it looked at, 18, including the UK, were, it said, non-compliant, and the rest were only part way there. But the FATF itself and the whole system of international regulation is perceived by many to be too weak and in need of a major overhaul. Mark Piat has served on the Financial Action Task Force and chairs the OECD Working Group on Bribery. He says the problem is not the FATF rules, but its attitude towards tackling corruption, which has a much lower priority than terrorist funding. We're realising that politically it hasn't been taken as seriously. If you compare with uh, the parallel system that the same outfit is enforcing, terrorism, financing of terrorism, it's an entirely different story. You wouldn't see this kind of uh, problem there. It's not just a matter of tightening up on the rules. The corrupt, the dictators like Gaddafi and their advisers, are often one or more steps ahead, hiding themselves behind a web of complex international dodges. Sometimes they hide behind government investment agencies, like the Libyan Investment Authority. The LIA has huge stakes in companies around the world. Juventus Football Club and the Financial Times, for example. Almost invariably, another layer of opaqueness is added by the secret world of tax havens and offshore shell companies. It should come as no surprise that Mr Mubarak's home in London's Belgravia is owned by a shell company in Panama. It's a similar arrangement to that used by the Gaddafis in Billionaire's Row in North London. It's surprisingly easy to open a shell company in a tax haven. But this worries international reform groups like the Tax Justice Network. If you wanted to set up a company in the British Virgin Islands, it's really not difficult. Let's just type in British Virgin Islands Company Formation. It's perfectly legal to use a tax haven and the secrecy it provides. The problem is that alongside quite legitimate activities, the tax haven may provide a cloak for illegal ones. It's hiding what's going on. That's what they sell. It's that secrecy they sell. The tax evasion, the criminality, the trade that somebody doesn't want you to know about, those are taking place elsewhere, not in the tax haven. What the tax haven provides is the secrecy to hide that other activity which is taking place elsewhere. Offshore regimes brazenly advertise that they're open for business and rest assured they will respect your privacy. In the British Virgin Islands, you can have a company in three days, directors and shareholders whose identities do not appear on any public record, exemption from all tax, and no need for any financial statements, accounts or records. But if tax havens and offshore accounts are so central to other more suspect activities, why aren't they shut down? We don't shut down tax havens for one very good reason. The world's bankers want us to have tax havens because they want places in the world where they can avoid regulation, where they can undertake transactions beyond the eyes of the financial services authority of their country. That's what they need tax havens for. That's why we can't get rid of them because we're not willing to stand up to bankers and say enough's enough. So shouldn't the international community be doing more to get on top of this issue, especially in dependencies like Dutch or British former colonies? I think it's a really good question why offshore resorts are still allowed to be in operation. Frequently it has to do with, um, let's say, um, secret service operations. They would like to funnel monies through offshore places so there is a kind of an official 
money laundering going on. A desire for anonymity can be perfectly legitimate, especially if you're buying a multi-million pound house. This one near Harrods in London is on the market for 18 million pounds. It's a popular area for buyers from the Middle East and Africa. Exclusive property is only one of the baubles that attract the super rich. Lavish lifestyles can also be reflected in other assets, yachts, fast cars, and even submarines. But the trappings of wealth frequently attract the corrupt, as well as the above board super rich. Paris is the shopping centre of choice for many dictators, particularly African dictators and their families. Here they can indulge their lavish lifestyles, buying up designer clothes, Ferraris, Bugattis and exclusive apartments, while back at home the majority of their citizens have to barely survive on a dollar a day. And none of this would be possible without the banks happy to handle the money and provide the services. One high-profile case is that of Teodorin Obiang, son of the long-time dictator of energy-rich Equatorial Guinea. Teodorin's ministerial salary is $6,800 a year, but his spending is astronomic. He hasn't gone unnoticed by French kleptocrat trackers. There is uh, an incredible discrepancy between the situation which is um, uh, which is one that many, many Equatorial Guineans are living on a daily basis with only with 50 percent of the population living with less than um, than one do dollar a day, and the lifestyle of of the son of um, of the president of Equatorial Guinea, who is who is purchasing properties in Malibu, luxurious, amazing properties in, in mansion. The sources of Obiang's wealth have been investigated in both the US and France, but he's never been prosecuted. His spending goes on a pace. He once spent a day on the Champs-Élysées buying 30 designer suits. His shopping also includes a private jet, speedboat, and large property estates. And recently, he commissioned a super yacht with a $380 million price tag. This is a scandal, and this scandal needs to be addressed. So that's it. This is what we're trying to, yeah. Needless to say, Obiang has had quite a few bank accounts over the years. Sherpa has collected much evidence and handed it over to investigators. Among the documents are cheques drawn on a Barclays bank account and another drawn on Bank National de Paris. French police have also seen the purchase documents for Obiang's Ferraris. The lifestyle of, of Obiang is uh, totally offensive, and to harbor that money to help him pile up a million dollar race cars and a mansion and tennis courts and all the rest of it is an obscenity. And any country that encourages that, helps that, or at the very least doesn't tell its financial institutions to cut the crap. Uh, is really, I think, uh, doing the world a great disservice. These are not victimless crimes. They rob the poor. Revenues from oil and minerals that should go to help local people and economic development are diverted or misappropriated into the hands of the corrupt rulers and government officials. The leakage of funds also robs the taxpayers of the rich world, whose taxes pay for overseas aid. The best figures that are out there at the moment show that for every dollar in aid that goes into developing countries, ten dollars come out in illicit financial flows and end up back in banks, in tax havens and in major financial centres. That consists of a mixture of corruption, so that's state assets being looted, as well as tax evasion by wealthy individuals and abusive tax avoidance by multinational companies seeking to stash their profits in offshore havens. If you really wanted to hide your money away, where would you go? Well, for centuries you'd have come here to Switzerland and opened a Swiss bank account. But strangely enough, the country favoured by spy movie makers and thriller writers for its banking secrecy now claims to be leading the fight back against corrupt money and the hidden hoards.
There is this James Bond image of Swiss banks, the idea that anyone who has a bank account in Switzerland must be hiding something. This really is a stereotypical image of Swiss banking. In fact, Swiss banks have some of the strictest anti-money laundering, know your customer rules to be found in the world. And I would say Swiss banks today are the last place where a criminal should try to launder money. Under instructions from the government, Swiss banks have frozen nearly $1 billion belonging to Gaddafi, Mubarak and Ben Ali. But not everyone is impressed with the Swiss banks' efforts to ditch their reputation for secrecy and identify stolen money. What surprises us is why the Swiss banks haven't reported earlier that they have assets uh, from these people and their uh, families here in Switzerland. Why they have reported only now that the Swiss government has ordered them has ordered the freezing of all the money in connection with these people. So this is a big question for us. Freezing the assets is the easy bit and the Swiss have been pretty quick to do so. The more difficult task is how to return the money to its rightful owners. Indeed, who are the rightful owners? And how can you make sure that any money that is returned doesn't just disappear again? A new Swiss law seeks to do just that. It allows stolen money to be frozen, confiscated and returned by Switzerland to legitimate owners in so-called failed states. Valentin Zellweger has been instrumental in introducing the new law. It is about countries that are um, weakened to the extent that they are no longer able to prosecute um, those who are uh, corrupt or no longer able to help us in sending the money back. But Switzerland is still wrestling with the problem of accounting for any returned money. It's not easy, but um, there is no one-size-fits-all uh, uh, solution. We are in, under intense scrutiny um, by the public, and therefore we have to find ways to assure that the money really benefits those it's intended for. In Switzerland, they have a new law. In France, Sherpa, a tiny organisation of human rights lawyers, has embarked on a David and Goliath court battle to return the assets of three African dictators and their families. It accuses them of using public funds to finance their luxury spending. One of them is the Obiang family, but Sherpa knows it's going to be a long slog. So far, no legal action has ever been taken in France in, in assets recovery. That's why no, uh, no, not a single pay, penny has even been uh, returned to victim countries. It's all about enforcement. Do the states really want to uh, to pursue, you know, corruption, large-scale corruption cases? Until uh, until recently, I don't think so. As, as a, you know, but mm, I do believe that things are going to change. But no matter how much we criticize banks and regulators, there's a political dimension which may be most important of all. Not unnaturally, banks argue that if it's OK for prime ministers and presidents to be friends of Colonel Gaddafi, Ben Ali and other dictators, why is it so objectionable to provide bank accounts for those same people? It's not that long ago that we saw these uh, dictators on television being f wined and dined and fated by the international community. One thinks of Nicolas Sarkozy uh, hugging Ben Ali on television during a state visit, and then the next day they're relabeled as a plundering uh, dictator. So, stopping the dirty money, the kleptocrats with their yachts and jets and the corruption behind it all just won't happen unless the banks and regulators get serious. And behind that, the biggest question of all, are the governments and international organisations of the West prepared to say no and refuse to do business with the corrupt regimes of the world? If not, then it will fall to the growing network of anti-corruption campaigners to chip away at the system. And if all else fails, there's still always the option adopted by the London squatters. Just take the dirty money back. And that's it for this edition of People in Power. If you'd like to comment on this film or anything else, we'd love to hear from you on aljazeera.net forward slash English. Until next time. Goodbye.